I took my first full-length documentary film all the way from the very beginning to winning awards for film festivals. And this is some tips and lessons I learned along the way to help make your path easier. After going through the whole process with my first full-length documentary film, No Limits, No Regrets, and this is, goes from writing to filming to editing to the soundtrack to promoting and film festivals, a lot of people have asked, what does it take to make a movie? So here's my experience throughout the process. The first screenplay I wrote was actually based on my first book, Bouncing Off Guardrails. It was a great experience to learn a new writing style. Writing a screenplay is very different than writing a book. It's easy enough when you're doing something like to think, what if? What if it makes it big? What if some Hollywood studio buys this and they make a movie out of it? You know, how much money would I get and all that? But it's also very important when you venture out into the film world that you are managing expectations and just be realistic about what it's going to cost to get to the point of being able to be successful. Once I finished the screenplay, I sent it out to everybody I could trying to get it out there. So mostly agents, studios, maybe directors, whoever else that I thought may be interested or help get it where it needed to be. What I quickly learned is not only did I not get feedback like I wanted on what I could do better, because every experience is a learning experience, but they wouldn't even look at the thing. And what I finally realized, some of the letters are pretty blatant in what they say, that the process does not even allow them to look at your screenplay because heaven forbid they make a movie that's similar or has parts of your screenplay later, if they've opened and looked at your screenplay, then it gives you somewhat of a legal avenue to say, hey, they took my idea. So most of them won't even look at it. And a lot of them will just plain tell you that. So at least I knew why it was getting rejected and not even checked out. Nobody likes to give up their dream. And I was thankful I still had my day job that I hadn't moved to Hollywood with high hopes and ended up a busboy at a dive bar. And I didn't give up on my dream so much as delayed the process and made myself more independent. When I set out to break the cross-country motorcycle record, I already knew that I wanted to write my second book on it, and I knew that I wanted to make a movie. But besides doing a few YouTubes on my channel, I really didn't know anything about filmmaking. I had to think about the constraints. I couldn't afford to go out and hire a large film crew and do everything super professional with you know, this crew following me around every step of the way. So I used GoPros and a Sony Handycam that were decent technology at the time, and I just used their onboard microphones. A more traditional approach would be that you write a screenplay and then you start filming that screenplay. But since mine was a documentary, I didn't know what was going to happen until it happened. So I had to sort of film things along the way, just getting footage of myself and Sunshine and Baron and our daily life, as well as the preparation tasks for the ride. And the story sort of writes itself. There's so much to consider just in the basic filming. You want each shot to look photograph quality, like where you've got your spacing right and the lighting's right and the colors are right. And a lot of that can be fixed in post-process. The important thing for me was since I was primarily the one being filmed, to always be very genuine, be myself, because you want to be consistent throughout the film. You want to make sure it looks like one movie being shot by the same person and you don't want to act fake in one scene and then genuine in another. It's just not going to look well. Especially the documentary where the whole point is you're telling a real story that really happened. Now for my case, the whole success of all this really depended on me successfully doing the task. If I didn't break that cross-country speed record on the bike, then none of it was going to happen. No book, no movie, None. So everything had to be focused on success of the task, which means you're not always thinking so much about film quality when you're just trying to get the job done. In something like that, I couldn't let the purpose of the book and documentary somehow negatively impact my ability to succeed at the ride, or I'd have nothing. Fortunately, I did successfully break the record. Then I had the book and the screenplay, and I had about two years of a whole lot of video clips that I needed to somehow stitch together and do a movie. The next thought I had was some documentaries you see, there's really no soundtrack. So music just adds another dimension to it that you don't normally get when you have no music. It compounds the emotions. It's a mood enhancer, 
whatever you want to say, but it definitely adds another depth to the movie. So it was important for me to have music. Now, I could have headed down the path of just licensing other people's music, which is probably easier, but since these experiences are a growth for me, I wanted to write and record a soundtrack. Now, I knew how to play guitar, sort of. I was a horrible singer, knew nothing about playing bass or drums. I really wanted to do the whole thing myself and make it awesome, but I had to accept my limitations, so I hired a buddy to do the drums and the bass for me. I did the guitar and vocals. I'm not proud of the vocals, they were bad. I actually wish I would have spent more time learning to sing before doing this. Uh, that's, that's one regret, I'll say, looking back, because the quality of everything you put out is so critical. With the vocals being that poor, it just takes away and distracts from the movie itself somewhat. Since I was writing the soundtrack from scratch though, it allowed me to write songs that really fit with the movie. So I could write about these real events and I could say this one needs to be a country song and this one needs to be a little bit darker and this one needs to be a uh, upbeat rock song and be able to go through and I did all the lyrics, you know, the lyrics to me were easy, they're just words. Um, doing the music was, was fun, I'd never done that before and even the solos. Uh, the arrangements and then stitching them in, I was very happy with how everything but the vocals came out on the soundtrack. It would have been a better product that I just hired someone who can actually sing to do the vocals, but I really wanted to do those two to make it, again, as genuine and sincere as I could. It's one of those things where any art, whether it's film, music, painting, whatever, you always have to find a balance of, am I doing this for me or am I doing this for the customer? And that was one of those where I tried to do what made sense of hiring the drums and bass, sing for myself because I enjoyed it, even though the viewers would have appreciated having a decent singer. And it does match my character in the movie of trying to do everything myself. So there's a consistency and a sincerity that comes with the way I approached it. With all the material now created, all the film, the screenplay, and the soundtrack, it was time to start stitching it together. And I kind of got the kick in the ass I needed with a deadline for the South by Southwest Film Festival just north of me in Austin. And so I put together in 80 hours, basically, a really rough draft of the movie on a Sony Movie Creators Movie Maker. And put it all together, submitted it, and it had a decent story, I thought, but it was very rough, very unpolished. And the feedback from South by Southwest is... We know it's early, but you really need to do colorization. You gotta make sure the sound is right. And they did not accept it, but that feedback was very useful because I didn't even know what color correction was at that time. Shortly after that, we had COVID. And then shortly after that, I ended up having some heart issues. And so I really couldn't do much anyway, basically in house arrest because of COVID for all that time. And I thought, okay, Now's the time to finish this movie. Before I started the final product, I knew it was important to have the right gear. I didn't want to get partway through the project and then realize I should have bought a better computer. I should have bought this side or the other. So I updated to Adobe Premiere for a video editor, which is an industry standard, and that's always good because that means there's a lot of YouTubes on how to use it. That means if you work with a third party, they're going to probably know how to interface with that program above some of the cheaper ones. I also realized to run that, I was going to need a better computer, so I had to upgrade computers to something with a better video card that I didn't have. You know, the footage was shot, so there was really not much I could do as far as improving the quality of the film or the sound, short of processing it, because that footage was already taken. As I was editing it, I had to think about make it easy for the viewer to watch. In other words, don't confuse them, try to explain who's who, don't drag things out and make them boring. Just make it something enjoyable. We've all sat through movies where there's some topic that just gets drugged into oblivion or some aspect that makes no sense whatsoever. You don't want them to be distracted with confusion. You just want them to sit back and enjoy the film that you created for them. The first step of this was to implement colorization, which again, I hadn't even known what that was. In Premiere, there's a really easy way to go in and do this. I actually made a video and the link is in the description below about how I use Premiere and set the color correction. Basically what this means is every clip that you shot, 
was going to have specific lighting conditions and it was going to have certain color tones as a result. So color correction goes through and makes it look like it's consistently shot with the same camera and the same lighting circumstances. And you do things like making sure that every time I shoot in this room, that wall color shows up exactly the same wall color. You pick a reference point. And again, the link below in the description will tell you more about it. Once I had the video part done, then I went back to laying the soundtrack. This was yet another challenge, let's say, because you're trying to make the music fit. You want to fill the walls, but you sometimes have to go over top of voiceover or underneath it. So you have to adjust all your levels and everything to make sure it fits. And again, that it's not distracting, but it's emphasized where it needs to be. The next step was to go to an external consultant for the finishing. And this was about a, I think a $10,000 cost or so, but basically what they did is went in and did a couple things. First, they adjusted the file to accommodate the fact that I had different film rates. So when I first started the project, I didn't know about frames per second and some of these other settings. So I just kind of filmed with whatever default on the camera was. What I learned later is that if they're not the same, then it can create these little glitches in the matrix, so to speak. So they went in and tried to correct all that to make sure it was smooth and consistent. And then they also did all the soundtrack mixing and mastering to make sure that you have everything and it can come out in Dolby 5.1 and you have proper adjustment levels because again, you don't want to distract the viewer with having to turn the volume up and down. You just want them to sit back and enjoy it. The soundtrack itself of just the music had already been professionally mixed and mastered. So that part didn't need any. It was just fitting that in with all the voiceovers and the sound effects and everything else in the movie. And working with them made me glad that I'd used Adobe Premiere because as I said earlier, it's an industry standard. So they're able to use that and they're familiar with it. Once I had the final movie files from the third party, the next step was to make the film available. Now, there were two paths. The first one was actually the easier one, which surprised me, but the first path was I needed to make DVDs and Blu-rays. It had the resolution to make a good quality Blu-ray, so I wanted that option, but I also wanted a DVD for those that couldn't watch a Blu-ray. I bought a DVD architect software, put everything into there where I broke out my scenes and I put the little thumbnails for them, uh, laid out the graphics for it. Everything came out really well for the DVD. When I went to the Blu-ray, for some reason, it was a little bit binary. There was like jerkiness in the motion of the, um, of the film. So I went back to the third party and we had to go back and forth a little bit on exporting in the right file type. And finally, I was able to get the Blu-ray where it would play acceptable. Always want to watch every format before you make it widely available. Had I let that Blu-ray go out that way, it would have been a disaster because most people probably would have noticed and complained it. And if I hadn't checked that, I would have invested all this money in this pile of Blu-rays that weren't watchable. So before you release anything, always make sure to go back and watch it again, be very critical, look for the details. Once the DVD and Blu-ray were finalized, I sent the masters to Bison to reproduce the discs and gave them all the artwork for the covers and all that. And so I have the you know, professional looking DVD and Blu-ray uh, movies that I can sell off my website, Instagram, Facebook, whatever. Now in parallel, I was trying to make the movie available on Amazon because most people just watch it digitally these days. In all that I just mentioned I had to do to get DVDs and Blu-rays available, I had those before I had it available on Amazon. It took so long because I tried to upload the movie, which this is an 82 minute full length feature in high res. So I tried to upload that and Amazon would always time out before it got uploaded. I just physically couldn't do it with their system. I kept trying, kept failing. And then I noticed a note that said, if you have it saved with Amazon storage services or something, then click here and we can link it over from that point. So I tried uploading it to the Amazon web services. Well, same story. It just timed out before it could upload the movie. What I ended up having to do finally is they sent me what they call a snowball, which is basically an external hard drive. They sent me that. I put the movie on there, sent it back to them, had to wait for them to take the movie off the snowball and put it on my Amazon storage. 
And then once it was confirmed there, then I could go back to Amazon Prime and transfer the movie over from Amazon Web Services to Amazon Prime. Once that was loaded, then obviously I could do the trailer and the key art and all these other things. And I don't wanna undersell what it takes to do just the artwork and graphics on things like this. I was able, you know, I have Photoshop and I have the artistic ability to create my own movie poster, to create my own key art for Amazon, whatever it may be, but not everybody has that. So if you don't have those things, you're gonna be paying someone else to do all that as well. But you have to have a professional look, because think about surfing through Amazon for movies. If you see an, a thumbnail with a very professional photograph and an exciting title font, you're going to be more likely to watch that than the one with a stick man that looks like it was done with crayons. Basically, nothing is easy. <laughs> Once it was available and I had it on Amazon and I had my discs, I was ready to go sell it, ready to go promote it. For people to watch your movie, they have to A, know about it, and B, want to watch it. I know that marketing is difficult and expensive, and ultimately it falls on me to be able to make it successful or not. But I knew where my limitations were. I knew that PR was going to be an important piece of this. And to me, that was the real key that I was missing is someone that knew the industry a little bit that could go out and get it publicized, get me interviews. I felt like I had a good story. Uh, you know, not everybody breaks a world record. I just need to get the word out on the movie because there's tons of motorcycle and car fans that would love something like this. I found a PR firm that really impressed me. They all sat around and watched the movie right off the bat before I even contracted with them to show their interest, to show that they, they were jumping all over it. They had one person for social media, they had a person that was going to do more PR type stuff, uh, press releases and getting interviews, uh, another group that was working with logo design and kind of website updates. And so they did the website update. Uh, we talked about brand colors, worked with them on the logo. That took a long time to actually get to a logo that I liked. And as an artistic guy, I'm always going to be a bit of a pain in the ass to work with people like that because I'm always going to have my own ideas and input, not just take what they give me. So we did all that. They were trying really hard, but it was frustrating for me because sometimes the social media posts weren't accurate enough for me and I'm a stickler for details, I know, or I didn't think the resolution was as good as it should be. I didn't like the way the photo was cropped. So there was some frustration I had, and that's, that's me being me and, and working with somebody else, I'm sure. But they were genuinely really trying to make this thing work. Now, after about three months and probably 30 plus thousand dollars I'd spent with them, I had to let them go because frankly, they were making no difference in my sales on Amazon. I wasn't making any more money. I was purely spending money with them. I knew that they were trying hard. They just weren't able to make it happen. So ultimately I had to remind myself, this is a business, you know, film is an art, the movies are a business. And right now the business decision I have to make is to cut them loose and figure out something else. After that, I enrolled in a couple courses, online courses, one in Instagram and one in YouTube, trying to get a better understanding of social media, marketing, how do I do this? How do I turn this into sales on the movie? And so I started putting a lot more work into those, started doing my own post, learn more about, you know, the, the photography of it, making sure that the posts look good, a better understanding about the hashtags for Instagram. I also started researching film festivals. Think about looking on Amazon at a few thumbnails of different movies. And if you see two that you've never heard of before and you read the description, okay, they both look good. If you see one that's got several of the little laurels from film festivals showing that it's won some awards or recognitions, you're generally gonna go for that one because that's sort of an indication, a badge of honor, right? Somebody thought this was a decent movie and they were willing to put their name on it and say, yes, this is a winner, this is a recognized film or, or whatever it is. So I knew that from a marketing standpoint, it would really help me if I had some of those laurels on my key art. People have to believe that your movie is worth their time and their money to watch it. So I started looking up film festivals and I found Film Freeway, I think it was called, is the website, which makes it super easy. You submit everything once and then they kind of submit for you. Each film festival is going to charge you money. I spent a lot of time and a lot of money running, you know, $20 to $100 per film festival. 
And I got a whole list of ones that said no, but I did get 12 or 13 festivals to either uh, give me an award for like a best documentary or recognition, uh, honorable mention, official selection, whatever it may be. So I ended up with all these laurels that I could put on my film art to give the potential viewer a feeling that this movie was actually worth watching. The next aspect was to pursue interviews. Again, something I wanted to do with the PR firm, didn't really get done, but I knew it was important to get the word out. So I started reaching out for my particular industry, which was motorcycles. I reached out to a lot of different motorcycle podcasts. Uh, I also had some that were more on like inspirational because of what I've been through in life and still be able to accomplish this and keep a good attitude and everything. I ended up with about 10 interviews in that period of time and some on YouTube, some on podcasts, but again, it was a way to really get out there. And when you make a film, it's one thing, but again, for it being a documentary, a lot of that is about me. So the more I'm able to be in the public eye or ear, the more they hear my voice. And as long as they like what they see in here and my character comes off as genuine and somebody that they would like to go have a beer with, then that's going to make them more likely to go check out my movie. The more I learned to do by myself, the more control I had, the more money I had because I wasn't paying someone else to do it, but the less time I had. So you have to be realistic about your constraints when it comes to time, money, and skill set. After about a year and a half, it was coming up on the holiday season, I kind of felt like the movie wasn't new anymore. You know, it's a year and a half old, the record actually happened quite a few years ago, and maybe it run its course. And nobody really likes to admit that, but you have to be realistic about it. So. I thought I'll do one more blast of advertising for the holidays, and I came up with things like you could buy a signed book, CD, and movie with a piece of the actual motorcycle that it was part of the ride when it broke the record, and make these kind of grab bag stocking stuffer gifts. Once the holidays were over, I left the movie on Amazon in case anybody would go there and rent it or buy it. I kept the DVDs and Blu-rays for sale, of course, on the website and everywhere else, but I also took the movie and posted it publicly on YouTube for free. Now, we all know that nobody's gonna pay to watch that movie on YouTube versus if it was on Amazon. So if a thousand people watch it on YouTube, you've made zero dollars from sales. However, if it's no longer really gaining you much revenue on Amazon, why not put it there and at least start building more of a fan base from a YouTube standpoint. And as I mentioned, I'd already taken a YouTube course and I was trying to do one video a week, generally on some kind of like motorcycle upgrade or something to do with cars or even health stuff, and trying to really build that and learn more about my intros and everything else. With that movie on my channel, I was able to get more views, more subs, and the watch time was more because for those people that would sit and watch it, it's an 82 minute video. Now, not everybody's gonna sit all the way through it, but there is more upside that way. It was more value to me to put on YouTube and try to get to the point of being monetized on YouTube to make money from ads than it was in movie format for sale only. In reading some of the reviews, talking to the family and friends who knew would be honest with me, there is always value in honest feedback. Some of the reviews were pretty rough, to be honest. A couple of them actually made a comment about it being cringeworthy, looked like some awful home movie, something or other. I guess I was a little surprised to read that because it should be obvious to a viewer that it is a home movie. I made a documentary and from my standpoint, I made that thing genuine. There is nothing in that movie that didn't really happen and wasn't really filmed. I didn't go back and try to recreate any scenes with fancier cameras or better lighting or anything like that or dramatize it, that what you see is what happened. I thought it was important to be very sincere and genuine about all the stuff, again, because it's a true documentary. But some of these people were making comments like they would almost rather see better production, but fake. In other words, if all I've done is had a camera crew with better sound, better lighting, more camera angles and me going across country, that would almost be more important to them than the fact that the footage they did see was real as it was happening. If I had a GoPro on saying I was doing 165 through the dark of night, that's what you saw and that was real. 
but that didn't seem to matter. Now, a lot of people love the movie, so it's not like this was the feedback from everybody. Some really appreciate what it took to get that job done. What it reinforces is that your production quality is so important in everything you do. We have better technology for making film right now in our hands than what a Hollywood producer had years ago. So the expectation is very high from all of us uh, that produce content, whether it's a movie or whether it's just social media at this point, you have to do everything possible within your constraints to make your content high production quality. Sound, visuals, all of them. Mine was shot by basically having a couple GoPros as I went and did this cross country record and my handy cam back at the house. And I thought it came out really well considering that it wasn't super organized or planned out. It was just kind of I'm gonna film what I can as I can. I had people filming the takeoff in California. I had someone filming me coming through San Antonio, someone filming me as I was going by Slidell by New Orleans. And so I thought I actually had a pretty decent set of footage that stitched a good story together. Regardless of the hecklers, the movie was one of the best experiences of my life. I was able to break the record, becoming the best in the world at what I loved. I wrote a second book about it. I wrote and recorded a soundtrack and created this award-winning documentary about the whole experience and put it out there for people to enjoy. And that's where the real reward comes in because art is useless if it's not shared. Subscribe to my YouTube channel below and let's celebrate turning fuel and air into adrenaline.